we've had a lot of rain recently. Today's like the first dry day. So I'm going to be mowing the lawn today. This is my milkweed where I've planted it. It's already sprouting up. Today is June 2nd. You can see from my milkweed enclosure, this root system has gone pretty far. Now it's no secret, I of course care about milkweed. But at the same time, I'm not going to let milkweed take over my entire lawn. Now what I normally do is check the plant, see if there's any eggs on it. No eggs on this one. If there were any eggs, then I would take that leaf off, take that egg into my system, and raise that monarch. Once I've gone around the lawn and I've checked every plant and I've retrieved any eggs that are on there, then I know that it's just fine to mow over these. Let's check some of these other shoots that are coming up. Nope. No eggs. There is indeed an egg on that leaf. There he or she is in all of its glory. Now currently, June 2019, the monarch butterfly is not on the endangered species list. So, I could just retrieve this egg, and I will later, remove the egg from the plant, raise that monarch, and also mow my lawn today. Whether or not the monarch butterfly would be on the endangered species list was going to be announced in June of this year, this month. But that deadline got pushed to December of 2020. Well, what if that hadn't happened? What if the monarch butterfly had been announced to be on the endangered species list starting this month? How does that change what I would do in this situation? When it comes to the Endangered Species Act, and we'll look at the fine details in a little bit, but essentially you cannot willfully harm, intentionally harm, or collect anything that's on that endangered species list. And usually for very good reason. But what about in the case of this? If I remove that leaf and I take in that egg, am I collecting the monarch butterfly? Especially when I know that my intentions are to raise it and then release it as an adult. Looking purely at what the law has to say, no, that would not be legal to remove and take in this egg. But if I follow the letter of the law with this, well, I know that that egg is here now, so does that mean I am legally bound to not mow over this plant? Would it be a legal situation where I actually wouldn't want to check my stocks anymore? Because as long as I remain ignorant as to whether or not there's any monarch caterpillars or eggs on these milkweeds, then I can mow over them, and I didn't know that there were any monarchs there, and thus I didn't commit any offense against the Endangered Species Act. Now I understand this is taking things to the extreme. I don't honestly think if this was part of the Endangered Species Act that mowing over this milkweed plant is going to get too many agents knocking at my door. But I think this is a good starting point for the conversation as to what really are the implications of if the monarch butterfly is put onto that Endangered Species Act. Of what we do in raising monarchs, how much are our hands tied and what are the things that we still can do? And when I first heard that they could become part of that list, just a whole bunch of questions, questions like this, started popping up in my mind. Let's explore some other angles of this idea. Come on. All right, to really have a proper conversation about this, we've got to make sure that we're on the same page as to what the Endangered Species Act really is and what does it mean to be an endangered species. The Endangered Species Act was passed by Congress in 1973. The purpose of it is that way different species can be listed and offered then legal protection to both be able to protect and then also recover those populations that are facing extinction. It can be tailor-made from species to species what protection is actually offered. Species can be listed as either endangered or a less degree than that threatened. To be endangered means that the species is facing extinction in either all or most of its range. Whereas the term threatened means that this species is likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future if various trends continue. So, what does it then mean if a species does become listed as threatened or endangered? In short, it means that the fish and wildlife may not be taken. You see, now we're getting into some legal terms that have to be well defined. The Endangered Species Act defines the term fish and wildlife. And in fact, it doesn't have to be an animal, it could be a plant as well, or a fungus, or any life form. And fish and wildlife then counts as also any product of that animal or plant, the eggs or seeds, and this is particularly important, the dead animal, or body parts of the animal. It was a really important term to define back then, especially for different markets that are available, whether they be black markets or the open market, for different animal parts, like ivory. 
or in the case of butterflies, different types of jewelry that's made using their wings. Just as an aside, the monarch butterfly is a beautiful animal. It's not your jewelry. And even if it's fake, you're still promoting the idea that butterfly wings are okay to be seen as jewelry. Please don't do that. Now the term taken or take is also very important to define here. To take is defined as to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect, or attempt to engage in any of those activities. Notice that word there, collect. That includes if you were collecting something to raise it with the full intention of releasing it once as an adult. That's still collecting. Okay, so with that covered, if in December of 2020 the monarch butterfly does make it onto the list as threatened or endangered, well, what are the immediate effects of that? Well, first off, essentially all commercial endeavors involving the monarch butterfly would be put to a stop. So things that profit off of monarch butterflies, especially like the breeding of them in captivity, those would be shut down. We would not be seeing monarch butterflies released at weddings and funerals and other gatherings. In addition, though, the suppliers who breed monarch butterflies in order to distribute for educational purposes, those too would be shut down. Monarch butterflies somehow involved in the jewelry trade or really any type of collection of them and their bodies to be sold, that would be done. Whether you'd be selling them for good intentions or questionable ones, whether you'd be selling them alive or dead or just parts of them dead, it would be put to a stop. And this guy here is A-OK -okay with that. Now in the rare chance that you're watching this video and you actually do make your livelihood from breeding and selling monarchs for, I don't know, educational purposes or something else, and, and you do it responsibly, just understand that you're part of an industry that does not have a reputation for doing it responsibly. There are numerous monarch butterfly farms out there that deal in monarch butterflies, shipping them out for releases, even sometimes for educational purposes, where the monarchs that are sent out actually are infested or infected with various diseases. And especially if you're raising them from one area of the country and shipping them to another, and those populations are released, well, their genetics are intermingling now with various populations. It's not good for their genetic development. For the population as a whole, it's causing more problems and not really helping anything. So, fair warning, if that's how you're putting food on the table, you might want to have a backup plan. Alright, but what about people like us? You and me. Someone who's just collecting eggs or sometimes caterpillars from the wild, bringing them into controlled environments, giving them a better chance of making it to an adult stage, and then releasing them once they have made it to adults. How would this affect us? Or what about that awesome sixth grade science teacher that you had that brought in monarch butterfly caterpillars and raised them with the class and everybody learned about the life cycles of insects and the important ecology and conservation? What about them? Well, currently the honest answer is we don't really know yet, but we do have some insights, some possibilities to look at and examine. For a species to be added on to the endangered species list, whether it's listed as threatened or endangered, and essentially the same protection is afforded to both titles, well, that species must be petitioned to be on there. And in 2014, a petition for the monarch butterfly was submitted. It was authored and assembled and put together by the Center for Biological Diversity, the Xerces Society, the Center for Food Safety, and Dr. Lincoln Brower, along with the Madison Audubon Society as a secondary petitioner. And they are petitioning to give the monarch butterfly threatened status. This petition is very thorough and a very impressive argument for the protection of the monarch butterfly. It's definitely worth a read, and I'll put a link in the description below in case you want to examine it yourself. And not only is this report so very thorough in explaining the plight and the threats that the monarch butterfly faces, but it also afforded some amount of importance for those who are doing citizen science and trying to conserve the monarch butterfly. Both just citizen science monitoring programs like tagging, but then also for citizen science household rearing programs such as ours. They brought up on more than one occasion in the petition that if the monarch butterfly does reach a threatened status listing on the endangered species list, that certain exceptions could be afforded for those who are doing these types of citizen science programs. They made the request that when the final decision is made, if the monarch butterfly does get listed, that certain considerations are made to still permit activities to continue that promote the conservation of the species, such as scientific research and monitoring, citizen monitoring and tagging, and non-commercial classroom and household rearing of monarchs for educational purposes. In Appendix B of their petition, 
all the way at the very end, they give their recommendations as to what this might look like, what some of the exceptions could be. They include exceptions for professional scientific research, but also for limited citizen conservation efforts. Individuals could monitor monarch butterflies, provided that it's overseen by a scientist, conservation organization, or other entity dedicated to the conservation of the species. And that such would have no commercial tie-ins, such as monarch commercial displays or breeding. Now, I believe that this would mean, when it comes to like monitoring the monarchs, that our tagging efforts, tagging monarch butterflies like many of us do in the late summer and early fall, that this would still be allowed. And that perhaps overseeing by a scientist or scientific organization, well, that could be like receiving the monarch tagging kit from monarchwatch.org or other types of conservation groups. I would hope that that would count as overseeing what we were doing. As monarch tagging provides some data that's very valuable to those who try to study the migratory populations, I'm pretty sure they'd want to keep that a pretty easy thing for us to do. As for raising them, those who are taking in eggs or sometimes caterpillars and responsibly raising them to adults, whether that be just at your house or even for teachers in the classroom. Well, their recommendation suggests exemptions for the collection of wild members of the species and rearing of fewer than 10 monarchs per year by any individual, household, or educational entity. Fewer than 10. That means 9. Now some things to keep in mind. This official decision isn't due and thus not likely to happen until December of 2020. Next, it's possible that when the final decision is made that they don't make the list. Third, if they do make the list, it is possible that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services don't make any of these exceptions. It's, it could be that it's 100% hands-off. And if that's the case, that's the case. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. Fourth, it could be that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, they do decide to list them, and maybe they do allow for all those exceptions that are recommended. Or maybe they have a few missing. Or maybe they add some of their own. Maybe they also set a number, but rather than it being nine, it's something higher or something lower. Again, we have to just wait and see. So overall, if the monarch butterfly does make it onto the endangered species list, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I don't really mean to word the question like that. In fact, I try to avoid such black and white thinking wherever possible. But when the question's been asked of me, that's usually how people are wording it. But here's the thing. There's definitely some positive things that would be very much worth celebrating. First, more awareness of the monarch butterfly's plight. More recognition as to just how serious this issue is and how close we would be to losing them. Next, commercial use of the monarch butterfly as a live animal or just its body parts for profit and the risks and negative impact that that has on the population would be done. Bye, Felicia. Next, when a species makes it onto the endangered species list as threatened or endangered, well, that usually can open up some doors for more funding being generated and allocated for its conservation. And also, beyond that, it would strengthen the argument that what is causing the monarch's plight needs to be taken more seriously. That specifically being the loss of milkweed due to certain types of herbicides and pesticides that are killing it off, and have wiped it out in many areas. The monarch butterfly being listed on the Endangered Species Act could really just be a step towards actually getting some regulation as to what kinds of chemicals are used in these herbicides and pesticides, and possibly even banning the most harmful ones. So understand, I'm not against this idea if it happens. I'm just not 100% for it. I'm kind of in the middle. <laughs> My opinion doesn't really matter, I don't think, in this anyway. But with all that positive, why am I not 100% for it, and what's any potential negative that could be there? Well, one might expect that a guy like me, who raises 100 to 200 or so monarchs a year, would be pretty bummed out about this. No, that's not the case. If I was looking at it in such a narrow-scoped, personal way, I think that that'd be both foolish and selfish. Here's what I have issue with, and as Bill Nye might say, Consider the following. What's the number one cause that has gotten the monarch into this position? It's been the loss of milkweed and the loss of habitat. And so, what's the number one way to get the monarch back up to a stable population? Planting milkweed. Does putting the monarch on the endangered species list, is that going to cause more milkweed to be planted? It's a big maybe. Maybe if certain funding is allocated to raise awareness and try to get government planting of milkweed, maybe but I don't see that as happening as an immediate effect. If in 2020, the monarch butterfly does make it onto the list, will less milkweed be planted in 2020 than would have been if people could still rear the monarchs? I think that that is a possibility. 
It's been brought up and argued by people before that raising 10 or even 100 monarchs and adding those to the population, that that's really not doing much, that it's just a drop in the bucket. But if that's how we're going to be judged as to whether or not we are helping the monarch butterfly by raising monarchs, just based upon how many numbers of monarchs we actually do release per year, I think that that's a short-sighted way of looking at what we're doing. Go ahead, viewer. Raise your hand if you've ever planted milkweed. Whether we're talking about you've done it several times every year or even just once. Now, what happened first? Did you plant some milkweed first and then get into raising monarchs? Or did you raise some of the monarchs first and then realize to help them even more, you should plant some milkweed? In the five years since parts one through five came out of the Raising Monarch series, I've received countless comments. You can go through on those videos and read them yourself about people who have gotten into planting the milkweed because they were raising the monarch butterflies. You see, when somebody actually takes in these eggs and caterpillars and cares for them and raises them, you develop an emotional connection to the issue, something that a website blog or even a YouTube video cannot possibly give you. I would be willing to argue that it's people who have raised monarchs, who have had that personal connection, they are much more willing to plant milkweed after they've done that than if they hadn't. You go door to door with a bunch of free milkweed seeds and maybe even some fact sheet flyers about what the monarch's plight is and how important it is to plant milkweed, and you might get some people to bite, but not too many. But if you're raising monarchs and you show to your neighbors what you're doing, you get them more interested a lot quicker. You get people interested enough in what you're doing that they decide to try their hands at it too, or even they stumble across some YouTube videos showing you how to do it, you now have somebody who is much more willing to plant milkweed. And on top of that, for some people, let's admit it, this might just become a one or two year fad as far as raising the monarchs. But if they planted the milkweed, well, even if they put the hobby away, the milkweed will still be there. Hey, I get it. We're busy people. And from year to year, somebody might find that the time they had to raise monarchs the last two or three years, they just don't have anymore. But they're not likely to uproot the milkweed that they spent time planting. And in fact, they can take some solace in knowing that the milkweed that's in their yard, well, by maintaining it, they still are helping out the cause, even if they're not actively raising the monarchs. They're still doing their part. And so that's what I would hope would be given more consideration and maybe have a louder voice the benefit of rearing monarchs as a catalyst for the planting of milkweed. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you for watching the video this far. I've got much planned this season, both in monarch videos and some other pretty cool videos I'm excited to show you coming out in the next few months. And if you're into nature, which I'm guessing is a pretty safe bet if you're watching this, I urge you to check out the Herp Quest video series. Find out about some reptiles and amphibians that could also very much use our help. I'm Rich Lund. Thank you for watching. Now... Let's go plant some milkweed. See you next time.